Well, good morning, everyone, and thank you so much for joining us today. I hope you're happy and well and having a great start to the year. And today we have a really exciting webinar to offer wildlife tracking. And along the Niagara Escarpment, there are over 300 bird species, 50 mammals, and 36 different species of reptiles. And there's so much biodiversity for us all to explore when we're out enjoying the Bruce Trail. So today I have the great pleasure of introducing our panelist. David Beamer has been studying and working in the field of mammal biology and ecology for over 20 years. He has managed provincial and territorial wildlife areas, conservation areas, territorial parks in Ontario and Nunavut. He also taught mammal ecology and tracking at Niagara College for over 10 years. David managed a 30,000 acre registered trap line in Northern Ontario between 2002 and 2010. And during this time, he spent several winters living off the land studying wild mammal populations. David is passionate about the Bruce Trail. He's walked the Niagara section end to end four times and has done many day trips in many other parts of Bruce Trail sections. David's eventual life goal is to live off the grid in his 100 acre sugar maple forest in Northern Ontario. David, it's a great pleasure to have you. Welcome and thank you for being here. Over to you. Thank you very much, Michael. Um, and uh, thank you for the invitation to be here. And thank you all for, for joining me today to talk about a subject that I'm fairly passionate about. And uh, I think we covered off a lot of my first slide, um, thanks to Michael. I uh, got into uh, tracking and uh, wildlife, uh, my interest in tracking wildlife uh, as a youth, like, like many people have just being in nature and uh, interacting with uh, with animals and populations, and and eventually I went to Fleming College to uh, to learn uh, fish and wildlife and ecosystem management, and that has gone off the uh, led to a, a pretty fun career in wildlife management since then. And uh, that's a shameless promotion of my Bruce Trail pack there at the bottom, which I've used as you can tell for many many years in many many places and many many. Many, many walks. All right, so the, uh, I'm, I'm gonna focus mainly on the mammals of the Bruce Trail simply because of a, a short, uh, the amount of time that we have today. And uh, there's so many, of course, and uh, everyone has, comes up with their own way of sort of breaking it down as to what tracks and sign they could be looking at. Uh, so I'm gonna go how, uh, go through how I, Think of it and break it down in, in my head, and hopefully that will help. Uh, but potentially you'll come up with your own way of, of identifying a track and eliminating tracks. And whatever works for you is just fine. So when, on the Bruce Trail, uh, the mammals we have are canines, felines, just the white-tailed deer out of the ungulates. Um, the, uh, there's lots in the weasel family. Uh, lagomorphs, which are rabbits and hares. Uh, rodents, which is our largest family of, of mammals in Ontario, uh, raccoons, uh, opossum, our only marsupial, and uh, we only have the black bear on the Bruce Trail. We have a few polar bears up by uh, Hudson's Bay, but uh, fortunately for hikers, they are not near the Bruce Trail. So to just tell you a little bit about tracking itself, it's more than just following the animal. It's more than just looking at the prints. Uh, I'm talking, going to be talking about like every aspect of tracking today, or as, at least as much as I can. Um, every mark and sign is a track. Anything that we can learn from what we see about the mammal's habits help us form a picture of what we're looking at, uh, such as scat, lodging, feeding activities, artifacts from the from the animals, uh, territorial markings, uh, etc. Uh, memorizing each print itself would be a, a huge task. Uh, and I am obviously going to be talking a little bit about the, the prints themselves. And uh, in order to, to make it simpler, we can place them into groups uh, based on the number of toes uh, and further analyzing them by the shape and the size, gates, and other characteristics of, of each print. SCAD, of course, is a, an important a uh, way to not only be able to determine what animal we could be looking at, but because tracking is really learning more about what's going on with the animals and with the environment in general, as well as just the species that we're looking at, 
Uh, the scout really helps us identify uh, what it's been eating, what, what it's not eating, uh, how its diet can be changing over time, if it's healthy, uh, etc. All things on top of just what species we could be looking at. But certainly most species have uh, uh, their own unique looking scat. Well, as far as lodgings go, um, we, uh, we encounter a lot of different lodgings uh, that we can identify species by, since, such as uh, beaver house or muskrat push ups, which are cattails and other things that they get muskrats will make um, in marshes and wetlands in order to feed from over the winter and, and sleep in. Uh, tree cavities uh, inside around the tree cavities. Uh, nests, hollow stumps, under rooted, under uprooted trees, and holes dug in sand. Of course, lodging is a wonderful place to find other signs, such as artifacts, as well as prints themselves. The artifacts, of course, are any parts of the animal that have been left behind. Uh, typically, that's feathers, and hair, and fur, and bone that you can uh, that you come across. Um, Biologists and researchers often use uh, artifacts as a way to track uh, wildlife populations, such as putting uh, hair catchers out there, where that's, uh, I'm going to be briefly talking about the eastern cougar later, and that's one of the things that researchers have, have used to find them. Uh, a lot of your tracking is going to be incidental. You're going to come across some of these artifacts and try to put it all together to paint a picture of what you're, what you're looking at out in the out in the forest. Territorial markings are uh, ungulate rubs, and in the case of Bruce Trail, it's going to be white tailed deer rubs uh, and bear scrapes. Um, I've, uh, I've encountered uh, many bear scrapes on like my trap line uh, where they will put their, their, their paws up and their nails up as high up as, on the tree as they can in order to make scratch marks. And that's a, that's a sign to other bears that, uh, hey, not only am I here, but I'm this big. It's the bear version of a cat's hair standing on end to make themselves look big. Uh, there's also, of course, uh, urine that's used by felines and canines, etc. cetera. Um, uh, scent, uh, me, I'll talk about how beavers use scent mounds. Um, otters use uh, toilets, uh, actually. They, uh, they always go, uh, leave scat on the same spot, and uh, that's a way of telling other otters that, uh, that they're around. And uh, generally, the territorial markings are indications to other animals that this is their, their space and their range, whether that's for a flag to, to hang out or whether that's a, a sign not to hang out and to stay out of their range. So feeding activity is, uh, is a good one. Um, not only does it usually tell us what species it is, but it's really important in determining the, the, the mammal's impact on the environment and what's going on in the ecosystem. Uh, that picture is, uh, of the lynx is uh, one that I took. It's uh, actually burying its food. Um, in order to make sure that other mammals don't find it and other birds for that matter. And uh, so that they'll have uh, food to come back to later. Um, and of course, we've got uh, um, muskrat and uh, uh, beaver chew and, uh, and porcupine munching on that top over there. So trails, of course, uh, uh, exciting trails. We, uh, when we find them, that, that tells us so much. Uh, and often more than we think of at first glance, um, many mammals will use the same trails. Now, one thing that I uh, often tell um, students or other people if I'm presenting is that uh, in order to determine where and why animals are using a trail, especially a human trail, uh, it's important to think like a mammal. And it's important because energy conservation is really important in nature. In fact, it's more important in nature than it is in human society. Um, it's important to understand that animals often do what requires the least amount of energy to do. 
So a lot of students would have originally asked me, isn't it weird that a, a wolf uh, would uh, travel on a snowmobile trail? Shouldn't they be scared of, of humans? Well, their wolves are, for example, wolves, lynx, et cetera, other wildlife, they're a lot, lot smarter than that. Uh, they, uh, they generally have a really good sense, really keen intuition as to what's safe and what's not. Uh, and a snowmobile trail, for example, uh, road or otherwise, uh, is a really packed down, easy place to walk. So often the play best places to look for trails, ironically, aren't 100 kilometers into the woods. It's actually the, the main trail or road going into the property in the first place. And not only will the mammals use our trails, but they'll often use their own trails, not just because it's an easier walk sometimes, but because there is so much information uh, that they want to look at as well, um, such as wolves and other predators will be walking the trail of moose or, or snowshoe hare or otherwise because uh, they are looking for something to eat, and they're also curious as to if any other predators are going to be coming along those prey trails in order to, uh, to see what's going on, to see if they have something to eat. So trails can quickly become wildlife superhighways. And uh, so when I find a nice trail, it's not uncommon for me to follow it at great distance. So various things that you can tell from a track. Um, and that's once again, a track, print, any sign. You can uh, identify the species. You can identify when it was there, whether it was running or walking, potentially why, uh, how long it stood there, the direction it's facing, which often means what it's looking at, but not necessarily always. Uh, is it injured? Is it healthy? Um, the direction that it's going and what its intention. Uh, is it hunting? Is it looking for food or is it being hunted? Uh, is it marking its territory? Is it a dominant member of a group or, or not? Um, for example, I had, uh, I tracked a pack of wolves on uh, my trap line for, for virtually the entire uh, 10 years that I was on the trap line. Uh, and I learned how many members there were in the group. I learned how many scouts there were. It was a large enough group that there was actually two main scouts. They were much smaller than the rest of the crew, uh, the pack. Uh, and I got to know the, the, the prints of the alpha male uh, itself uh, by, uh, by activity, by size, uh, and whatnot. So when you can actually start identifying which is the dominant member of the group, things can get really fun. Is it hungry? Uh, how many animals uh, are there? Uh, or is it the same animal? For the example, uh, lynx often use, if there's a, a mom lynx uh, um, that's walking through the snow, uh, often it's uh, young, uh, younger lynx, its offspring, will walk in the same footprints as the mom who generally leads, the, and they'll all follow the same footprints in order to reduce, make it look like their numbers are reduced. And you have to, I often have to follow the, the lynx tracks for quite a while until uh, eventually one of the younger lynx gets excited by something off the trail and then jumps away. And then I see a deviation in, uh, in one of the tracks and then I can, that can help me identify whether there's more or not. Uh, it, in that case, it was having fun. So is it having fun or is it frightened? Uh, is what you can, something you can tell, uh, whether it's a family group and is it investigating you? Uh, I have gone out uh, tracking moose one time and uh, I followed it for about a mile. And then the next day I went out to the same track to take a look and I'd found as I was following it, um, it, that moose or another moose, but I'm in my head, I'm thinking the same moose was actually behind me and following me. So there was human tracks on moose tracks and then moose tracks on human tracks and then human tracks on moose tracks on human tracks on moose tracks. So sometimes wildlife investigates us too. All right, so where do we wanna look for the actual prints themselves now? Uh, some of the best places to look uh, are the fo at the forest edge because 
Uh, at the forest edge, you have, uh, let's say that it's uh, the edge uh, of a forest and a prairie. Uh, we have three habitats there, not two, uh, because the forest edge itself uh, is an ecosystem in itself uh, because there are a lot of edge specialists. So if you walk along the forest edge, not only are you going to see sign of uh, the dwellers of the forest, but you're also the dwellers of the prairie. Let's say it's a prairie, it could be a wetland or whatnot. And you're also going to get the, the edge specialists. So um, wonderful place to look. Uh, besides streams, uh, partially because streams and rivers and creeks can be uh, mammal and wildlife superhighways, but also because the mud at the side of the streams is really good places to see a track. Uh, and they often leave uh, bits of uh, their prey and their food behind as well. Uh, where habitats meet, for example, the forest edge, but it can be where, uh, you know, where wetlands meet a prairie or grassland or what have you. Uh, around potential dens and nest cavities, obviously the, the newer the better, but not necessarily because if there's an old, um, uh, an old beaver house or there's an old, uh, uh, muskrats uh, or gopher hole, uh, and I'm tracking a coyote or a wolf, I'm almost guaranteed, I just know that that uh, animal is, uh, just can't walk past like a gopher hole or groundhog hole without uh, going and investigating and having a sniff. Not just because they're interested in the groundhogs being at that hole, but also because all the other animals are also going to the groundhog hole to investigate. So. Uh, an animal like a wolf is going to the groundhog hole to smell the domesticated dog and the lynx and the bobcat and the groundhog and everything else. Sand, of course, is a, a good medium for a track because it's uh, it's such a it holds a track so well and shows such good definition, such as this bear track that I that I took a picture of. By the way, you'll notice that there's a lot of uh, loonies in my picture besides me. Um, I carry a loony with me all the time when I'm tracking uh, because it's really important to have something for scale if you're showing pictures or taking pictures. And uh, I like it to always be the same thing. So it doesn't have to be a loony, it can be a quarter or a nickel or whatever, but um, if you, you shouldn't use something like, like a mitt uh, or a glove because uh, gloves can change in size based on the type of glove and the uh, the size of the person's hand, but a loony is always consistent. So, if, uh, yeah, and you can you can measure it later as well. I don't carry a ruler with me, uh, but I can take a I can uh, with the, I can extrapolate based on how wide the the loony is as to how big that track is later. So yeah, these are all good places to look for tracks, but. It's important since this is, uh, you know, a lot of times you're you're going to be on the Bruce Trail because this is Bruce Trail talk. When you are on the Bruce Trail, it's important to stay on the trail um, and uh, and just appreciate the tracks and the sign uh, that you can from the trail. All right, how do I identify the track maker? Um, so the and once again, more associated with prints right now. I'm going to focus in on that for a while, for most of the rest of the presentation. Uh, so the toes and the claws and the shapes and the sizes um, are all really important ways, um, direct and indirect registry. I'm going to get into all of these uh, in a greater detail uh, momentarily, by the way. Uh, the gates and the patterns, including the stride, uh, the habitat, uh, as well as the complex. Because you can be looking at a print that is, for example, uh, you've figured out that it's a feline print, but you can't tell whether it's a lynx uh, or whether it's a bobcat. Well, uh, determining range, like where are you? Are you in uh, bore, uh, the boreal forest? Or are you in the prairie? Are you in the southern Ontario? Or are you in northern Ontario? Um, answering those questions will be able to separate whether you are uh, looking at a lynx or a bobcat. There's other ways, but you tell as well, but those are good ways. All right, taking measurements. Um, now, uh, there are a lot of different tracking guides out there. 
uh, if you're really interested in tracking or if you're curious more about tracking, I would recommend getting one. Um, a lot of times, a lot of the information you can find on the internet these days, but uh, so potentially just your cell phone will work. But a lot of times knowing the, the widths of the tracks, uh, the gates, uh, the straddle uh, will help you separate out the different species that you might be looking at. Um, I'll show you a picture of my uh, guide of choice. Uh, it's one that's the smallest and can fit my back pocket. It is the, uh, the best guide is the one that you actually bring with you, not one that you leave. Um, so don't include clause in the measurements. Um, the measurements, uh, and sometimes you may even want to uh, make note of these things if you're uh, keeping track, especially if you're uh, if you're doing this as any kind of research or anything like that. You generally measure the, the track, the width, uh, and the gate. Uh, so the, the width is also known as the straddle. Uh, basically, that's between their, their shoulders and their hips. Uh, how wide is their, uh, their tracks apart? Uh, but also the distance between, uh, between the prints. Um, so between a full set of prints, not necessarily between their front and back, but often between one set of prints and the next, because not only will that help you with what the species, but that will also help you with uh, behavior as to whether it is running uh, or uh, whether it's a gentle jaunt or, or what, what have you. So as far as the... Uh, the gates and straddle and patterns. Um, there are many different categories out there uh, to break them down into uh, in order to um, categorize them, to identify them. These are the ones that I'm uh, the most uh, that I use. Um, and, and I welcome you to start with this or go a different path if you'd like. Uh, it's mostly it's the same behavior, it's just basically names and semantics as to what they're called. But, um, and I'm gonna get into these a little bit as well, but we have diagonal walkers, pacers, bounders, and gallopers. We can fit virtually all animals into, or all mammals into these four. Uh, and knowing that sometimes they will actually change. Uh, so, uh, you know, a, uh, a bobcat will could be a diagonal walker when it's uh, just walking uh, slowly, uh, but as soon as it's running, uh, it will become a bounder because the bounder is a faster way of walking, so or running. Um, they're not they're not necessarily family specific, but there are often trends, and I will give you some examples of that as well. All right, diagonal walkers. Um, we have uh, cats, dogs, uh, ungulates, um, and uh, basically it's the uh, it's the longer legged animals, and that's why that's why they walk this way. There are trends to these four different groups. There, the categories the uh, that's often associated with the animal's size and shape. And I'll show you that in a minute. So obviously cats, dogs, and like deer, they all have long legs. So diagonal walking is a very efficient way of, of walking and that's why they do it. Um, so the opposing, the opposite limbs move at the same time. Uh, the front right and the back left and then the front left and then the back right. This is important because pacers are a little different, so we'll, we'll get to that in a minute. Uh, they may or may not have direct or uh, indirect registry, and what that means is, as you can see from this, uh, the lower picture um, of, uh, of a deer track, um, that is indirect registry. It means that the, the back foot steps gently like uh, on the front track, but not it's not an exact fit. Uh, the, the back foot doesn't necessarily step exactly precisely on the front print. That's indirect registry. Something that does direct registry is like, uh, like felines. 
uh, the lynx uh, and bobcat will often, their back foot will walk, will step right into the, the print that their front foot left behind. Uh, and that could be an efficiency thing, that could be uh, to reduce the, the impact and uh, the amount of tracks uh, on the trail or whatnot. So, but uh, we can tell a lot from direct and indirect registry as well. For example, with deer, the, uh, you can tell whether it is a male or female uh, from the indirect registry. You see the, the rear feet are always going to step on the, uh, the front foot because the back foot is the last, uh, the last print to, to register um, because Deer don't often walk backwards. Um, and what happens is, is that a, uh, a, a buck deer, a male deer, uh, has a wide shoulder base um, because they have to be strong. They're, uh, they're fighting with other male bucks uh, during the mating season. Um, the, uh, they have to have a strong, strong front. Uh, whereas uh, the doe, the female deer, uh, they don't need as strong a of uh, shoulders, front shoulders. Uh, however, they're childbearing, so they're more likely to have wider hips uh, uh, and rear hips. So the the, the male deer have uh, their uh, front feet, which is the the, the prints that are going to be underneath are going to be uh, on the outside and the rear feet are going to be on the inside and of course the reverse for uh, for does. So all right pacers. So I mentioned the uh, uh, the moving the right and left at the same time um, it would come up later. The pacers are a wide bodied animal so that's sort of why they uh, walk the way that they walk. Um, I often think of myself as like a pacer when I'm trying to, when I'm, I've been in a chair for too long and I'm trying to throw myself out of the chair. I sort of throw my hip over and up I go. Um, so the pacers, they, they do their front right and their rear right, and then their front left and their, their rear left. And that's because they're, they're a wider, their body is a wider uh, mammal. Um, and they have uh, smaller legs um, relative to their body when compared to something like a deer or a wolf or coyote or, um, or lynx or what have you. Some examples are the, the bear, the raccoon, the possum, beaver, uh, muskrat, wolverine, skunk, badger, etc. Um, in which case you can you may go, but David, I've seen uh, uh, I've seen uh, you know, wolverine that were that were bounding, or a skunk that was bounding uh, and not pacing. Yes, uh, when certain animals start uh, picking up speed, they often stop pacing and often turn into something else. Often a bounding. It's very common. All right. So uh, our bounders, we have our uh, long-bodied but short-legged animals. Uh, this includes uh, most of the, the weasel family, especially the, uh, the, uh, the long-bodied, not-so-thick ones. And uh, the exceptions being like the, uh, the badgers in the weasel family and uh, uh, the, the, uh, the wolverine is in the, the, uh, the Mustelidae weasel family, but they are, um, they're a wider body, so they're more likely to be pacers. Uh, but we have mink, marten, fisher, otter that are all more likely to be bounders. And uh, they look a lot like gallopers. And I'll jump back and forth in the slides in a second. But the key is that the rear feet land behind the front feet. Um, so both gallopers and bounders, they will jump. Uh, they'll be jumping through the snow or the, the, the brush or what have you. And of course, their, their front feet land first in order to catch them and make sure that they don't roll over and steady themselves and get ready for their, 
usually larger, bigger feet that come in. And uh, so with the bounders, the rear feet will land right behind the front feet, and then they'll lift off again uh, like a spring. Um, so a lot of these will look, will be very difficult to tell um, what species it is, or even if it's a bounder or a galloper, unless you have really good, uh, a really good look and very good examples uh, of the prints themselves. You need to know, be able to tell from the track, from the print, uh, which is the back feet and what direction it's going. Otherwise, uh, it may be very difficult to be able to tell from the tracks alone what species you're looking at. So here's the gallopers, and they're a lot like the bounders, but the main difference is, is that they land with their front feet, but then the rear feet come through and, uh, or come around, I should say, and land in front of the front feet. So obviously these are gonna be the shorter bodied animals such as rabbits and squirrels, whereas the longer bodied animals uh, like the weasels are going to be boundaries. So I'm just gonna jump back and forth for a minute. You can see how there's the boundaries with the rear feet landing behind. And here is a, a squirrel with the the rear feet landing in front. And that is the main, main thing. In the case of the, the rabbit, more so than the squirrel, but I have seen the squirrel too, because the rabbit has a larger mass, it takes a little bit more to steady itself as it lands. So as you can see from the bottom uh, tracking picture there, um, it, uh, it, it doesn't land with both front feet at the same time. It will have one foot down, sort of like, whoa, okay, hold on. And then it'll put its other foot, front foot down and to steady itself, uh, to catch itself, because it can be a lot of uh, inertia going there. And then the rear feet come around and, and land, and then they jump off again. Uh, like I mentioned, what happens when they pick up speed? Um, diagonal walkers can become trotters, a new phrase, but basically it's like just uh, less direct registry. They're just they're still diagonal walking, but uh, the, the tracks and prints are, are further apart. Uh, or diagonal walkers can become bounders or, or gallopers, more likely bounders, so it's around here. Uh, pacers can become diagonal walkers, uh, uh, but uh, more often are beca they become bounders. Uh, and uh, bounders and gallopers, they rarely change their gait. There isn't any more efficient way of running. Uh, uh, there is no such thing as like a bounder becoming a diagonal walker to, to go faster. It just doesn't work that way. Bounding and galloping is generally the fastest way to move through the forest or, or ecosystem. All right, so as far as the toes and the claws and the shapes and sizes, uh, we're gonna look at uh, the nails and the claws. Uh, to see whether they show up. Uh, we're often going to, often the, the tracks will show hair. That's important in some cases, uh, especially, especially in like lynx, where the lynx track is, uh, is really has a lot of hair. Uh, we're going to count the toes uh, and we're going to measure the track. Uh, the nails and claws are important, as uh, I'll say in a couple slides, uh, differentiating between uh, the felines and the canines. We'll get there in a minute. So the canines we're looking at uh, in uh, the Bruce Trail are uh, the timber wolf, the coyote, the red fox, the gray fox. Uh, oh, actually, uh, sorry, gray fox uh, down in Point Field. Here, we're not likely to uh, see the gray fox in uh, the Bruce Trail. Um, and of course, domesticated dogs, um, which I'll I include in this because you're going to see a lot of domesticated dog tracks on the Bruce Trail. So for all the wild canines have, uh, are going to show the four toes, the diagonal walkers while walking, uh, and they always show their nails. Uh, felines have retractable claws, um, and, uh, which means that they will sometimes show their claws, but often not. So if you aren't sure what you're looking at, follow the tracks, follow the trail, uh, and keep looking for the nails 
And if you eventually see that the track, that the males disappear, you may very well be looking at a feline instead of, instead of a canine. Oh, by the way, I should uh, mention that uh, uh, the timber wolf, you're going to find the coyote, the coyote, the red fox, and domestic dogs all on the Bruce Trail. Uh, but the, the timber wolf, uh, the gray wolf, you're uh, likely only to find um, on the Bruce Trail and maybe a little bit south. Um, there are uh, probably hybrids of uh, uh, wolf and coyote and or domesticated dogs uh, in other sections of the trail, but I'm just going to, for the, sack of this, for the sake of tracking, let's just break them into these categories and, um, because you'll be able to tell, it'll be very difficult to tell whether a wolf is a wolf or a hybrid or, or whatnot. All right, um, so uh, in order to determine the difference between the wild canines, um, you're gonna look at uh, the size difference is gonna be the, the, the biggest one, of course, uh, wolf tracks being a lot larger than coyote tracks, uh, which are gonna be a lot bigger than fox tracks. Um, and domesticated dog can be any kind of size, of course. Uh, but also the habitat and the behavior. Uh, coyotes prefer uh, fields um, and, uh, and wolves prefer forests. Uh, neither exclusively use those ecosystems, but certainly uh, that's their preferred. Coyotes, of course, like uh, edge uh, habitat as well. The, uh, their straddle is really important in a lot of species. So the fox is the easiest to, for me to identify. They have a really small print, but their, their shoulders are so narrow that their tracks will almost look like a straight line, uh, almost like a cat, except their, uh, their gait is, is longer. And then eventually you'll see prints and then the print will look different. But, um, but I've never confused a fox with a coyote. Uh, the coyotes and wolves can sometimes be comparable sizes, so that's when you have to look at habitat and behavior. So yeah, here's an example of, uh, of a fox track. Let's see how it's almost a straight line. And the best way to identify the difference between domesticated dogs uh, or even wild dogs, and, uh, but more so domesticated dogs, uh, and the, uh, the wolves and, and other canines is the, once again, going back to energy conservation, wild animals walk with great purpose. They don't have, they know they don't have the energy to, to investigate every little thing that they want to. They really need, they have a purpose. They know where they want to go. They know where they want to look. Um, and they just, they walk a straight line. They don't have time or energy to waste. So they will walk very straight lines without getting off track too much, except for maybe uh, marking their territory. So here's an example of, um, you know, a domesticated dog and how it would sort of go all over the place and investigate all over the place. All right, going over to felines. So we have uh, the house cat, which is found everywhere. Uh, the bobcat, which is not common and very difficult to find, uh, but likely found on various places on the Bruce Trail. Uh, the Canada lynx, which sadly is not, uh, but uh, um, are too old to be left out of its reputation entirely. And uh, the Eastern Cougar, which is a funny one because um, the Eastern Cougar were determined, which is the same thing as uh, mountain lion or, uh, or puma, uh, different names for the same species. They were originally declared extirpated from Ontario. Uh, and then there were enough sightings and whatnot uh, that the Ministry of Natural Resources uh, had to determine that it was data deficient. They no longer could definitively say for sure that there wasn't any cougar in Ontario. There probably aren't, but there is still a chance that there might be. Um, there are certainly signs of cougar from time to time uh, and the Ministry of Natural Resources 
often says that they are uh, escapees or something like that. I don't know where they're escaping from, but um, it's really the big question is, is that can we have a self-sustaining population of a cougar in Ontario? That's the big one. I, I don't know. I hope so, but I don't, I really don't know. Um, cougars can travel such a long distance. It, it actually wouldn't be impossible for them to uh, go hundreds and hundreds of kilometers, uh, or I should say thousands of kilometers, because they can travel a couple hundred kilometers a day. Um, it wouldn't be impossible for them to travel from their existing ranges in other parts of Canada uh, to Ontario, uh, but just because there's one doesn't mean that there's a self-sustaining population. So data deficient, that is the current um, uh, label for Eastern Vancouver. Chances are you're not going to find any, but please, if you ever do, if you ever see any sign, please email me. All right, so uh, as I mentioned, the cats rarely show their retractable nails. They're very inquisitive. Uh, the lynx print uh, uh, is almost always fuzzy due to its really hairy pad. It has a snowshoe for a, a paw. Um, and the cougar print, uh, which this is a cougar print here, uh, the, the track that I'm showing, um, it is sometimes paired with a tail. Um, and it's the only uh, feline that is going to be that big. Uh, and it's also that's also going to be paired with a tail. So I overlaid a canine with a feline. So even though this one is uh, this track is a cougar track, um, it's still basically uh, a reasonable example of what felines look like. And I have another slide for this, but um, it's I can't point in this PowerPoint, uh, but it's sort of like a C going around the pad, whereas in a, a canine, there's more of an X going through like the toes, if you can visualize that at all. So between the, that and the, the retractable nails and the nails showing up in the canine, those are good ways of separating out the canines and the felines. Here it is again, we have the, the tracks. You'll, you'll see the lobe, uh, that's C in, uh, or B in feline, C in the canine. Uh, how it's, uh, it has the, the singular lobe at the front of the pad for the canine, and it has like a double lobe for feline. That's one that, uh, that I often use. All right, white tailed deer. Um, I think most of you will be able to determine that uh, what, uh, which are the deer tracks, but um, the Bruce Trail, the, we do have other species uh, of ungulate in Ontario. Uh, but the white-tailed deer is, uh, to my knowledge, the only species of ungulate that uh, is on the trail. So um, having said that, you may very well find horse or even cow, um, but uh, just based on size, those are, those are easily uh, eliminated. Um, so yeah, the, the white-tailed deer may or may not, uh, you may or may not be able to see the two claws. That's the, that's the, uh, the, the pointy toes behind. Um, and the, there's a significant difference between uh, the, the sizes that you can find. Uh, the dominant males are up to four times that of other cats. All right, so the weasel family, I won't be able to spend a lot of time in great depth on these, but um, these are a lot of fun to come across. Uh, these are the main species that you're going to see, we're going to have in Ontario. Uh, the three weasels, uh, the three in the weasel family, um, the American mink, uh, the marten, the fisher, the river otter, and the striped skunk. Um, chance of there being, uh, uh, the, we're, there's, we have a little green in Ontario, but they're not going to be in the groups. So here we have the uh, uh, the, the, the ermines, the, the, the short tail weasel, long tail weasel, and the least weasel. Uh, the mink, I took a picture of that mink. Uh, they are not typically found in trees, but clearly they can climb because that one did. Uh, if you actually see them, you can see that little uh, pearl white underneath the chin. That's the, 
uh, that and their 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 coat, uh, their shorter hair is uh, a great uh, way of determining what the difference between its uh, we'll call it its cousin, which is the martin. The mink and the martin are around the same size, but and the martin certainly lives in trees. More on the boreal, you'll find mink all over Ontario, but the martin are going to be more around the Bruce if you find them at all. Uh, likely in forests, pine, pine forests, that sort of thing. Same with a fisher, uh, possible to see them in other sections, but most likely if you see a fisher, you're probably on the Bruce uh, Peninsula. Um, the skunk, we have uh, a few different species, uh, striped, spotted, and hybrid, and, and otherwise. Um, but they all kind of look like that. And, uh, and of course, uh, we have the river, river otter. So the, these species, they, uh, they look a lot like a squirrel because they're bounders, um, but they're different. Once again, identifying that they're bounders rather than gallopers will likely be the key uh, clue that you're looking at something in the weasel family rather than uh, a rabbit or a squirrel. And then after that, you basically figure it out by size. If it's uh, really wide, it's a fisher. If it's uh, small, it's a weasel. Uh, and if it's in the middle, it's likely a martin or fisher. And then after that, uh, determining whether it's a martin or fisher, um, if it goes to the water, or sorry, martin or mink, uh, if it's going to the water and spending a lot of time near the water, it's likely a mink. And if it's spending most of its time going in and out of trees, it's likely a martin. Um, I'm going to have to speed up my presentation a little bit at this point in time. Uh, the river otter, we have, it's considered the, the wolf of the water. Uh, they're often found around beaver lodges. Not only do they, are they one of our only species that will prey on beaver, uh, especially right from the lodge, um, but they will uh, they will uh, go and live and sleep in beaver houses, beaver lodges uh, after the beaver have have left. Uh, I mentioned earlier they do leave toilets to mark their territories. They're one of the few species that likes to keep pooping in the same spot, which doesn't mean they have to, but they certainly like to. Uh, the one trapper that I apprenticed told me that uh, the otter on his trap line. Um, they had a like a range. They have a circle uh, that they do, and uh, when their scat is starting to turn white uh, in the summer, they're pretty sure that they'll be able to see the uh, the otter soon uh, because it, it takes about two weeks or so. This is what the trapper was saying for the scat to start turning a bit white. Uh, and that's also how long it took for the otter to make, make the full circle of the range uh, and then come back to the same coil. Uh, they're more active at night, but can be active all the time. Um, they are uh, generally pacers. They can be pacers or bounders. Uh, they have webbed feet, as do muskrat and, and, uh, and um, beaver. Uh, but uh, the muskrat and beaver are not bounders. Uh, also, a watch the tail mark, uh, which often shows up as they're walking, because their the body is so low to the ground. The rabbits here that we, uh, the lagomorphs, uh, we, uh, we have the snowshoe hare, uh, which you're likely only to find in the Bruce Peninsula, uh, but the rest of the trail, you're likely to find uh, eastern cottontail and jackrabbit. Uh, jackrabbit not being a native species, uh, but, and uh, so this, there's three different sizes, basically. Um, the, it, the hair is, the snowshoe hair is the largest, the jackrabbit is in the middle and the cottontail is the, the smallest, but that's, that's a difficult way to, there can be a lot of size variations. So uh, you may very well just have to eliminate based on range and actually uh, finding more information and even seeing them if you can. Uh, they are gallopers, as mentioned. Uh, they have four toes per foot. Forgot to mention that the uh, the weasel family have uh, five toes. Uh, that's an important uh, way to determine the difference between them. Uh, felines and canines are going to show four toes. The lagomorphs, they have four toes per foot. 
Um, and uh, there, because of their size, their rear feet are much larger than both their front feet and that of other gallopers and, uh, and bounders for that matter. And so rodents are, uh, I'll only be able to talk about some of the main rodents. Um, we have the beaver, the muskrat, the squirrel, the porcupine, the groundhog, uh, and then of course, what I just, uh, the, the small mammals, which are affectionately known, the mice, the rats, the voles, and the shrews. Of course, we have bats too, but we don't often see too much prints of them. The small mammals are uh, often subnivian, which means that they live underneath the snow, uh, occasionally coming out to see what's going on or uh, to, to go to a new area. They're easily identified by size, uh, and they're often associated with feeding activity. Squirrels themselves, uh, they have, uh, they're different and they have four toes in the front foot and five toes in the hind. So if you're not sure whether you're looking at a rabbit, you've identified that it's a galloper, uh, but you still can't tell whether it's a squirrel and rabbit. And believe me, it can be tough sometimes. Try to find that five toes on the hind foot. And if you can find the five toes, you've got yourself a squirrel. Um, obviously, a much better and easier way to identify them is that squirrels will often, if you've traveled and tracked them far enough, they are likely to go up, uh, up trees, whereas rabbits will not. Uh, flying squirrels, of course, so that picture I took in the top right, uh, they're very difficult to track, but because they don't, they spend as little time on the ground as possible, but you may get lucky and find some. Uh, oh, and the, the leaps I was mentioning, uh, uh, of course, that's for red and black squirrel, um, whereas the, the flying squirrels can leap much, 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 much better. All right. Uh, the beaver um, is uh, obviously an aquatic mammal, lives in beaver lodges, and has webbed feet. Uh, this uh, track, this trail to the bottom right, is a common uh, sign that, or a common trail that I have seen. And that is, uh, they don't like coming out in the winter uh, because uh, they're easy prey. Uh, in the winter, the uh, wolves will, I've seen a wolf sit behind a, uh, a rock uh, when they found one of these trails. This often means that they've run out of food. Uh, they did not prepare enough food. Some trappers say it means that their food is starting to spoil. I don't know about the spoiling theory, but nonetheless, it mean, usually means that they're coming out uh, from, for some fresh food. Um, Scent mounds, they leave scent mounds. When I was trapping, I could go up and down the creeks and I could smell when I was close. Um, they, they, the, the Latin name is Caesar canadensis, uh, named after its Caesar gland, um, because its scent mound is an important way to tell other beavers that, hey, I'm here, this is my range, uh, leave me alone. Uh, we have muskrats, uh, which are much uh, much smaller. Obviously, uh, they often they also won't be found during the winter. Generally speaking, um, they have four toes, uh, also a pacer. Um, they rarely go far from water uh, because they are they don't have a lot of protection versus predators besides uh, just uh, not being available. Uh, for predation. So they're good swimmers, so that's how they get away from predators and stay safe. The raccoon that you're going to find a lot of on the trail, um, there are five toes on both feet. And uh, I think of the, the raccoon tracks because there's generally not a lot of fur on the raccoon prints. Um, it looks as it looks the closest to like, like a baby's hand. Um, that may seem strange to you now, but when you're actually out there looking at it, hopefully you remember that and you'll go, you know what, it actually does look like a baby's hand. Um, they are 
they're flat footed, um, like bears, but smaller. And uh, yeah, like I said, everywhere, found everywhere on the, on the groups. Uh, groundhogs, uh, they're our, uh, one of our few true hibernating animals where it's not just a deep sleep, it's they are full hibernation. So you will not see uh, groundhogs over the winter. Uh, they live in burrows, so and they often don't go very far from their dens. Uh, so if you think that it's a groundhog uh, and you can't find it, but you're not sure and you can't find a den, then uh, uh, yeah, it may not be. So the, the interesting thing about groundhogs is that they have four toes on the front foot and five on the rear. So if you're not quite sure whether you are looking at a raccoon uh, or even the cat or something else, look, look for that fifth toe on the rear and that will let you know. Uh, a possum, um, so it's got five toes on both, but the, the real identifier on these is this, look at that thumb that it has. There are only only marsupials, and they uh, uh, they're, they're reasonable climbers, and they they have this they have this thumb that really stands out. Um, besides that, they are uh, about the size of some muskrats or raccoons, uh, so can be uh, can be confused by them. So look for that. The amount of toes on the front and rear and look for that thumb. All right, uh, bear, which I think is my final animal. Um, they, uh, they're often around blueberries in the summer, especially in Northern Ontario, a uh, huge range in size. Uh, I have known of black bears up to 600 pounds being, uh, uh, being found, uh, existing. Um, in, Ontario on the Bruce Trail, you're you're most likely to see them on the Bruce Peninsula part of the Bruce Trail, but they uh, I'm in Belleville. They're they're around here too. Um, they uh, whether they, they yeah, but if you're on the Bruce Trail, probably uh, the most likely place you're going to see them is in the Bruce Trail. Certainly, you want to be wary of them then. This is a picture of. Um, uh, one of my bear encounters, uh, this, uh, this black bear came right up to me. Uh, I was in BAMP and, uh, uh, reading a book and, uh, I looked up and there was a bear about six feet away and it was, its nose was in one of my footprints and, uh, I saw it before it saw me. Uh, luckily, I had bear spray, um, and, but I got up and I, I looked at it and I'm like, okay, black bear, um, the safety mechanism is to make a lot of noise and scare away the bear. Um, if it's a black bear and if it's a grizzly, uh, you're supposed to play dead. I don't know <laughs> if I could ever do that, but that's what they say. Uh, but I'm looking at this going, okay, black bear. So I made myself a big and I made lots of noise and it came towards me anyway. And I went, no, 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 don't do this. Don't make me do this. Cause I had the bear spray out and, uh, and then it stopped and it looked at me and it was like, yeah, no, I, I want to do this. And it walked towards me again. And I went, no, no, don't do this. Don't do this. Stop, go away. And then like the third time I yelled at it, it decided to, to leave. And I had enough time to grab my camera and take a picture as well. Um, however, uh, in the, uh, in reading up on black bears since then, uh, I came across this uh, diagram. And um, well, you know, I'm not exactly completely convinced that it was a black bear now, but uh, yeah, anyway. Uh, so maybe I didn't use the, uh, the best defensive technique, but I, uh, I, I lived uh, another day uh, and I'm here to present to you um today so all's well that ends well i guess but uh i've encountered black bears uh, a few times um they're definitely something to be respected uh, but black bears generally run from from people uh another example that this 
animal that uh, this bear that I encountered may have been a grizzly because it it uh, it kept coming towards me. But black bears generally like they uh, they uh, they run away. They they don't want to encounter people. So um, yeah. Here are a few uh, places to go for more information, uh, sort of my go-to places um, for tracking. If you want to know more about some of our mammals that are at risk, uh, there are some species at risk sites. Uh, and if you want to read more about the behavior and ranges and uh, biology of mammals, there are a few of my, uh, my go-to uh, my go-to websites as well. Uh, I mentioned that I take a tracking book with me when I uh, go tracking. This is the, uh, the book I take, and I take it because it is, uh, it's as small as can be uh, with still having all the information you want. Fits in your back pocket. So that, uh, that is my presentation. So thank you very much. Uh, I taken up a bit of the question and answer period of time, but um, if uh, Michael feels that I have any time left over, I'm Happy to answer some of your some of your questions. Yeah, well, thank you, David, for a wonderful presentation. I know um, I learned a lot and uh, can't wait to put some of the new um, skills to use along the Bruce Trail. So we're absolutely happy to answer any questions. If you have questions, please type them into the question and answer down below or the chat. I can see that too. And I'm wondering if we have any questions. And while people do that, David, can you maybe talk about some of the advantages of tracking in the winter versus the the summer or fall or spring? Sure. Well, um, so obviously the tracks are going to show up really well in the snow, which is good. But uh, because we can actually, uh, we can look at when it last snowed, we can look at temperatures, uh, we can tell more about the tracks themselves. So um, if, if we have a fresh uh, track and we know that uh, it just snowed, yesterday, then we know that it's within 24 hours. The, but I like to take my, my finger and like touch the track itself and feel for like crystallization because after the animal steps in the snow, uh, let's say that it steps on the snow in the morning, if the, uh, and let's say it's fresh snow, uh, the, the sun will come out uh, all day and we'll just, melt that snow depending on how cold it is. But even if it's really, 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 really cold, uh, the sun is still going to uh, kind of crystallize and harden uh, the outside of that track. Uh, so if I'm touching that track and it's moving right away, like there's, there's no crystallization, it's not hard at all. I know that animal came right through. Whereas um, if it's hard, it could have been this morning or it could have been the day before. It's hard to get that kind of uh, um, a timeline. Uh, it's harder to get that timeline if it's walking through the sand or something like that. Okay, that's um, really helpful. And um, I've got a couple of comments and then one final question that we have time for. So just a, a comment from Marsha Courtney, that was wonderful and I will watch again. So thank you, David, that's, uh, that's wonderful. And then also from Audrey Barkley. No question, very informative and interesting presentation. So thank you. And then the fi final question for today is, what can you tell us about sightings of wild boar along the Bruce Trail? Okay. Um, so that is unfortunately uh, a fairly new thing, something that uh, biologists have been bracing for for a number of years, um, simply because we know that we have wild boar and enclosures, and it was just a matter of time before wild boar got out. Um, in like the Smoky Mountains, they they got out uh, years ago, um, uh, twenty years ago or more, and they've wreaked havoc on the ecosystems and bred. Uh, and now there's there's tons of them. Um, they uh, unlike some animals, uh, some livestock, they adapt to their uh, to the wild area pretty quickly. Um, they so, and now we have lots of videos of them being out um, in the wild. I don't, I couldn't tell you where on the Bruce Trail exactly they are, uh, but we know that they're 
are lots of um, lots of video of them uh, being loose, and uh, so they're out there. They would be if you see uh, boar tracks, uh, be wary because they can be uh, they can be fairly dangerous. Um, yeah, keep your animals if you you're supposed to keep your animals on the, uh, a leash anyway, but certainly have them on a leash if you have, if you're they're with you and uh, if you can tell whether the the tracks are fresh you may want to get out of there okay that's really helpful and as far as i'm aware i know there's been some reported sightings but i'm pretty sure that the ministry has said that there's no established populations along the niagara government right now which is really great news so yeah. um yeah. so that's wonderful and then david i'm going to end it with one more comment from one of the attendees from ruth moffitt uh, one of our perennial end-to-end -end hikers, and Ruth says, this was really interesting, and I can now look and judge tracks that I see on the trail with much more confidence. Thank you, David. So what a great way to end it. And um, David, we're really grateful for your time and expertise. Thank you so much. Yeah, well, thank you. It's been uh, great being with all of you, and uh, thanks for having me. All right. Happy have a great day. Thank you, everyone. Happy hiking. Take care. Take care. Thanks.